So hello and welcome to our talk show about cloud sovereignty. My name is Andreas Stolz and I'm here together with uh, Gabriel Gara, our chief, hi, our chief of cloud services, and Silvan Galush, our business owner for Sovereign Cloud. So I'm very happy to have you here. Hi. So the systems is launching Sovereign Cloud this year, mid of 2022 is the plan. The sovereign cloud of the systems, we understand, comes in two flavors. One of it is powered by Google, and it's supposed to be its first kind of its own on the German market. It's a product that offers full compliance with German regulators, whilst the retaining, that's what it says, features and elements of public cloud functionality. So that sounds very interesting. And today we want to speak in this round about sovereign cloud. In particular, what is data sovereignty? I think it's important to start with that. What is the next generation of cloud technology in Europe? And we will also touch a little bit or have to touch a little bit common standards like uh, Gaia-X. And last but not least, this is my, my favorite and my hobby, industry clouds, right? And yeah, perfect time now, right? I have you both here and uh, we will touch these topics. I would like to start with cloud sovereignty. And yeah, I'm, I'm not going to quote now the International Data Space Association in detail, but the point is really there is a strong push that European data should be hosted and owned in Europe to keep it very simple, which is obviously not the case or not very often the case let me say it like that because we all know that the market is dominated by u.s headquartered hyperscalers and uh, that's something which uh, the european union wants to change now i would like Correct. to discuss with you now why does the european union want to change that and actually what is this concept of data sovereignty about to start with mm -hmm. so i think the reaction from, from EU and European market and European um, large companies, um, I think it's they're trying to really create kind of a counterbalance to what the US hyperscalers, uh, but also Chinese hyperscalers, all, always more and more actually coming to the forefront. Uh, so there needs to be an answer to that. And one of the biggest reasons why we need that answer is there's a ton of euros in, uh, in the UA, EU headquartered companies that is simply flowing out to the platforms like Amazon or um, AWS on Amazon, um, Azure on Microsoft, uh, Google on Google, right? And now we have also the, the new Chinese, uh, like, like Alibaba and Tencent Cloud, right? So that's, I, I would say that if you, take, if you look at it from a pure business point of view, that's, a re that's reason enough, right? But then the second reason is exactly the data sovereignty part. And that is that even if, even if the companies would be okay that the money flows out, they need to address the point that the data is simply grabbable by any other foreign entity and cannot, will not stay within EU. So I, I guess the, the motivation is really on, this, on these two levels. And the answer to that is collaboration on one hand, so that's the Google part, like you said, but also trying to build a community uh, that could be an, uh, on, on an open technology, and I think we'll get to that a little bit later on. But that's the, that's the second part, that's the open sovereign cloud, right? Now, hand yeah. over maybe to Sylvain so, a little bit to get to the detail. Yeah, it's not only about the market share where hyperscalers are, are eating the, the European companies, you'll say, in, in terms of, of profits and revenue, but it's also about who, about who really owns the data itself, who has access to them. And with the open source cloud, that's, that's why we're specifically reaching to the healthcare and public sector, uh, sector businesses, where from the nature of, of its data, it cannot be uh, right. really pushed to the, to the outside and, right. and, and US market. Exactly. The, co the code, the, uh, it, it's quite simple. The companies that use it will own the code. That's the, that's the logic behind the open, open source community. And that's the Gaia X idea, I guess. Okay, thank you. Obviously, we touched this at the beginning already, it is of great relevance for the European, European Union to, uh, to have a sort of independent position yeah, in that uh, uh, cloud space. And that obviously also pushes the whole discussion of uh, 
sovereign clouds. And uh, I do understand that there is now a declaration signed by 27 members of the European Union, which basically are pushing all these activities of uh, uh, European cloud. There is also a significant amount of funding. However, it seems to me that there are very diversified activities currently. So uh, looking into what happens in Italy, looking into what happens in France. Yeah. And I want to connect this now in terms of, can you elaborate a little bit what you see is the European Union position, but also how does it play with countries? How does it play with actually a the systems offering, because the systems is perhaps right. then more German, perhaps Dach, yeah. Yeah. but is it a European solution? Yeah. Will there be a European solution? Will there be country solutions? So what's your view on that? Right. So you mentioned it, uh, and I also actually had to look it up because I didn't know that, uh, that uh, uh, Italy is trying to build their own uh, uh, government cloud, right? Uh, same happening around France. Um, so... That, that can very well be true, and it might end up really in a quite diversified uh, public cloud setup in Europe. It, it very well can be. But I think the idea of why the 27 countries got together is to create a kind of a standard around this, how to approach this. And this is the Gaia-X uh, community or Gaia-X, um, let's say, um, ecosystem. Let's, let's try and put it this way. Mm -hmm. um, and what they want to achieve with that is really that on, one, on level one, it is a community. So that means uh, everyone that uh, builds uh, their cloud using some kind of open technology, uh, like for example, the sovereign cloud will be one, uh, can contribute to this community and other members of the community, community can benefit from it. This is a very different setup than what we have really in, in, uh, in the US-based hyperscalers or Chinese, where they really own the code and they will not let it go. It's not open source, right? It's a very different uh, mechanism. So I think the approach there really is that level one is community and level two is products. They want to exchange the code that we build up, the product that we build up, and we enhance it uh, in, in, a, in a more really of a developer uh, kind of a sense. If you know game communities and how they work, this is, I think, a, a, a really good push into that direction. And regarding how the systems is positioned here, so. As you, as you mentioned, I think our play on the market, on the EU market, is really going to be centered around the DAC region, so Germany, Austria, and, and Switzerland, because this is where we are strong. It is also a huge portion of the EU economy, right? Let's face it. Uh, and uh, this is where we as the systems, you know, as, a, as our mother company, Deutsche Telekom, is actually amazingly strong on the, on the customer market as well. So I think it's kind of a logical step that we play a major role in, in, in the DAC region with the Open Sovereign Cloud. And anyway, I mean, you guys are, are very um, familiar with competition in your own family because I would like to discuss now a little bit about the products itself. Yeah? And just from outside view, partly outside view, right? It's not easy to distinguish because there is an open telecom cloud, which is sort of sovereign cloud, maybe for in layman terms, maybe not. I'm sure you can elaborate on that. But you also have uh, very strong private cloud offerings. And uh, then uh, I'm wondering then wh wh where's the boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what is a private cloud in comparison then to the sovereign yeah. cloud? And you also have offers uh, in collaboration with the uh, hyperscalers. So right. Perhaps, uh, and that's why I say you are good in competition, because obviously uh, you have from everything a little bit how it plays together. That would be a question. And, yeah. and, and how you see that in particular uh, with regards to the Open Telecom Cloud, the OTC one, and, and perhaps also a little bit about technology in terms of open stack. I right. think that would be interesting for our right. viewers to understand that better. So both technologies or, or offerings that you uh, mentioned are... Uh, related to the infrastructure as a service. So as an output, for example, OTC, Open Telecom Cloud, is a typical provider of the virtual machines and some additional services. Same uh, future cloud infrastructure, which is using VMware as their code te technology, is an output, is providing the infrastructure layers. And where we want to differentiate and where really we see the value is, is bringing platform and services on the top of that, uh, which we can offer an, to the customer. And for example, the ambition is that uh, we produce also a dedicated infrastructure, which is Gardner on Metal, but we want to place also our secure offering, for example, on ODC, on FCI, or 
on Azure or on AWS on hyperscalers. So I think FCI, you need to elaborate for the people. Yeah, who it's, it's future saying. cloud infrastructure <laughs> for the people who are not, not, not these systems related. That makes sense. But really, we want to use these layers as an infrastructure where we on the top can elaborate with our platform and additional services to make it secure. Right, right. So the, the idea is really that, um, and this is maybe when we go a little bit back to what we said at the beginning, right? That the sovereign cloud, uh, the entire initiative into systems uh, can be kind of branched into two areas. One is the Google sovereign cloud, which you mentioned, and the other one is the open sovereign cloud. So the Google sovereign cloud is going to be also a platform. So Google hardware, NT systems, or Google data centers, uh, and you put this, this security and sovereignty stack on top of it, and it's an entire infrastructure platform and services altogether. Mm -hmm. So that's one variant of it, one branch. And the other one, that's the open sovereign cloud, which is just like Sylvan described, just the workload that you can put on pretty much any platform or any infrastructure that you want. We are starting, or the project is starting to firstly develop that, uh, uh, counting on the fact that we will use our T-Systems platforms like OTC, Open Telecom Cloud and FCI, but there should be a possibility to use it also in conjunction with Azure or AWS, right? So that's kind of kind of the idea uh, and how it how it differentiates itself. And the question that I'm getting is really what benefits for clients there are if we combine the Google sovereign cloud and open sovereign clouds towards the customer. So maybe I can answer that with an example. Imagine we're gonna have a client, hopefully some uh, international uh, insurance company, and uh, will probably will be difficult to beat Google or any other hyperscalers with the amount of services they provide maybe on a daily basis within their cloud. So technologically, they are far away there as, uh, from beyond us. And But where we want to combine and as, as offering is really with the uh, open source and cloud is for typically the private businesses, for example, your personal healthcare data, which cannot be accessed and manipulated with any other technology and combine it with the application, for example, with the insurance, which do not need that much of security restrictions, but are need more functionalities for Google. So that's why the aim is to prepare the wide portfolio of technologies and, and as an answer to, to the application uh, that customer needs to manage. And maybe just as a, as a kind of a summary of what we're saying. So th this what we what we said in so many sentences uh, maybe shows or gives an answer to why yet another cloud, right? Uh, and that's that's the reason because there are, there are private clouds like FCI, there are uh, open public clouds which uh, like Open Telecom Cloud, which also cater to a specific sector or business. Then there are hyperscalers, but still there is a demand on the market for a sovereignty type of cloud where you can really control the data and control the code that you use. It will not be owned by anyone else, but it will be a public kind of a cloud. So that's the reason why at another cloud and why T-Systems is building another uh, of, those, of, those, of those fancy things. And currently the, the, uh, the market tracks this and is, it, we already have, we already see huge demand, especially from the areas that, that Sylvan mentioned, like health, like, like banking sector, like government sector where they cannot get hold of the data, like the dark sector, which maybe brings in um, some, some additional reasons why they don't want to you know, get, get, get the data and get the uh, control uh, of the platform to someone else, right? So there, there really is a huge need on the market, and that's why T-Systems has been going and running this initiative in conjunction with the Gaia-X um, setup as an answer to the global situation. Well, I guess for banking, you also need to uh, leverage then your mainframe migration factory, yes. right? <laughs> but uh, jokes aside, um, these uh, I, do, I do understand now that there is a, a Google part, but there is also what I would call a cloud agnostic part, yeah, which which runs on yep. lots of clouds, right? Yes. And I like this example that uh, you have uh, something like, uh, let, let's say, Secure Haven, right? And then you have the things which you can also have on a public cloud. Yep. Is this the point where Gaia X comes into the play? Because the standards, yeah, how to do data exchange and so on, uh, play a relevant part in that. And if so, yep. can you a little bit elaborate on what's your role? What's your uh, first of all, maybe how you see Gaia X initially? We discussed at the beginning, but maybe yeah. a little bit more in detail. But also, uh, what's your contribution? What are your teams in Slovakia doing? Yeah, how you position yourselves there? Uh, right. I would like to talk about that a little bit, please. Right. 
in Slovakia, in, in T-Systems um, uh, here, what we're trying to build is really not just a, um, you know, a, another bunch of people that operate stuff, right? This is maybe important to say for the broader audience, not just within T-Systems, right? Uh, what we're trying to build here, and this is really the, the key word here, build, is we have steering roles and responsibilities out of cost itself. Sil Sylvan is one of those guys. Uh, we have product managers. We have CTO role. That is, that is a, a Slovak person. And all of these people uh, have been given the task to really to build, uh, so also a coding section of it, to develop or co-develop uh, uh, the way we will run services in that orchestration layer that was described, so the garden, the kima, et cetera, we're gonna be, we need to develop the services that will be like, for example, Elastic, so searching, uh, searching engine, uh, Kubernetes uh, as a service, databases as a service. There's a ton of stuff that, you know, the, the hyperscalers are already doing, delivering in a native way, but they don't, cannot benefit from the sovereignty setup that we are, we are doing, right? So a lot of this is really built here in, in T-Systems and in T-Systems Slovakia, which is, which is also, uh, I would say, quite a difference uh, compared to like where we were five or ten years ago as, as ST Systems. You know, we just operated stuff that was given to us by, you know, someone. And especially it's important to realize that uh, we don't do reselling on any other technology which was developed by some other international company. We are building up from the scratch uh, our own uh, product portfolio. This is probably where also uh, Deutsche Telekom Slovakia steps in for the first time where we are having this opportunity to not take, uh, let's say, uh, VMware or any other cloud or any, any something that, that was developed by somebody and, and, and sold us with some sort of level of support and guarantee. This is something that we are developing from scratch. And if I say develop from scratch, I mean all the three layers. One is the Gardner on Metal infrastructure layer. So we have guys that are coding that and we've already ordered the hardware should be delivered in about two or three months and then we built on the top of that these auto scaling activities we implement this this Gardner kubernetes for orchestrating containers and we already have uh, developers and devops teams who automate uh, these uh, devops pipelines and right. who bring this offering like databases like streaming indexing services kafka and so on into our offering so we'll be able to to run the application and luckily we are already running some of the uh, proof of concept for some uh, some healthcare business it sounds very interesting. Right. I would like uh, to go back a little bit into technology now. This is more like uh, I need to understand that. Uh, and you are the right guys to ask that. No? Uh, OpenStack we touched briefly. And uh, I'm curious about that uh, OpenStack is something I understand uh, we have in place with the Open Telecom Cloud, but the That's hyperscalers are not using OpenStack yeah. at all. So... What is this about? Why is OpenStack uh, in one part of the world uh, famous or used, but uh, the big players actually are not using it at all? Are there advantages, disadvantages? Is there different approaches behind it? Yeah. I think it's an approach, and I'll, I'll very shortly give it to you because I'm, <laughs> Sylvan is much more technical than I am, but from a business perspective, uh, that was always an, uh, an anti-pole kind of a situation. If you think back really, really back between Windows and Linux, right? This is actually like where kind of maybe even before that, but that's kind of where it originates because Windows is a licensing based approach. Linux is an, is an open approach where you share the code. Yeah. Both are quite successful. Both were actually created around, you know, uh, the same geographic area. So it's not like just the Chinese came up with some open, uh, open stuff, uh, open stack uh, technologies. So uh, this, is, this is kind of, it's been slowly developing and developing. Now we have really the hyperscalers, which are licensing based approaches. And then we have a lot of open kind of uh, clouds and sovereign, sovereign, open sovereign cloud is really one of those and the technology drives this 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 uh, exchange on a Gaia X community level because you cannot exchange license code. You will not I will not hand you my license code, right? Because then, <laughs> hey. so and okay. I really see the answer of, of the the OpenStack is that the technology evolves so much to Kubernetes. I mean you can Google 100 reason why Kubernetes uh, because it's scalable because it's more efficient because you can easily adapt and route, uh, write cloud native application to that and, and easily deploy it uh, on any uh, environment right but uh, OpenStack uh, by the way still in our offering for example the edge computing which I was driving several several years ago uh, still 
some clients who are running in a typical environment which need uh, to host their application on typical virtual machines, Windows or Linux. Uh, so there's still a market for that, yeah? But in terms of flexibility, I think it's a natural evolution. Everything goes containers, Docker and Kubernetes for further. Okay, before we uh, come to the uh, industry cloud topic, uh, which I also want to touch, I would like uh, to uh, understand a little bit better what your teams are doing. I mean, I can imagine if we look into that topic, it's about data sovereignty, it's about sovereign cloud, it's, it, cloud, <laughs> cloud. it's obviously something which is very important for the European Union, for the European countries. And I believe that you must be very proud to develop this here out of this city, out of this region, out of this country. So how is it? Uh, how do you actually... Uh, find the people to do that but also how is it perceived i can imagine you have hundreds of volunteers yeah who want <laughs> to do nothing else than that but at the other end then probably skill skill based matching is, is a bit more difficult yeah. so tell me a little bit what's the team setup how do you find these talents this is very new right it's not like you have every people who can right. do that how do you groom them how is it's, it going so as we speak uh, the portfolio consists mostly of kubernetes which is written in golang so primarily we are trying to look for people with the kubernetes uh, experience and scripting experience although we realize that uh, currently it's a high market demand especially for devops engineering position in age each and every company is looking for that and uh, what is really our strategical advantage, yeah, which we can bring to our people and, and also people who would like to join us. And the, the answer to, for that is that we want to give really opportunity for the guys who already have some experience with, with Linux or with scripting to come and join the journey. We already have started together with the HR reskilling program. So we're looking for also talented people who want to do the certify, uh, certification on the Kubernetes. As we provide all the necessary uh, trainings yep. and certification. And uh, yeah, this is how we are bringing the colleagues. So we, and we already have uh, people who have, for example, big data experience, uh, edge computing experience or cloud experience. So it's easy for these people to adapt to these kind of technologies. But we are also looking for uh, candidates and for the people who would like to reskill and position their self more towards to, the, to this Kubernetes and, and open cloud. So uh, that's why we are also happy mm -hmm. to invest a lot of time and, and, and education to those folks. Yeah. Yeah, like this is, it's a, it, it's a big adventure, right? Uh, and it, it and, and also in terms of scale, so it, it's not a small scale product that will you know disappear once we build it up and uh, that's it. And we got 10, 10 architects and we're done, right? So that's not the case. Uh, it's it's if you consider like the fact how is it positioned on the entire market, it's part of the GaiaX community, and really uh, a, a lot of the EU based companies are pretty much lining up to test out the capabilities of this cloud. So uh, I think this is also important to say. And yeah, let's face it, it's a cool product, right? Like we, we don't really have a lot of products like that in uh, overall in the, in the, in the IT industry where you, can, where you can play around with, uh, with large scales, large impact setups, utilizing the newest technologies. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of, of uh, machine learning capabilities in that we'll be, probably will we'll, we'll get there. There's a lot of uh, uh, cloud-based, cloud-native services mm -hmm. that are being uh, that are being developed. Uh, you can you can really um, ju just just the Kubernetes part itself, right? This is this is where the majority of the industry uh, is going. And you know, having the having the option and the capability to have GoLang developers uh, that are creating how those containers will be looking like. That's I think that's cool. So let's face it. Yeah, I'd like to also mention that this whole product has to be. Uh, operated uh, and maintained from the EU countries as we'll be accessing right. uh, technologies, open source technology. So this is a precondition and a little bit of, of strategic advantage for the Slovakia uh, as well. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And then we also have, uh, as Kabi previously mentioned, important steering roles here, yeah, like uh, product owners, product manager. And together with I, uh, our engineering team, we have, let's say, a strong voice to impact where the product will go, how it looks like at the end, and where we'll be able to successfully onboard the client. So with the uh, Really, that goes with the responsibility yeah. at the end. That's it. The, the other side of the coin yeah. is when, <laughs> when we don't deliver, there is no product <laughs> for these systems, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of sun, there's also some shade. <laughs> but um, I like to hear that. Uh, it's great because it's, uh, it's the way from labor arbitrage to yeah. product owner, right? Yes. And that's actually what you're doing here. So yep. great story. 
One of the other reasons why I'm, I'm very much a, a fan of Soaring Cloud is uh, that it connects so well with the other things we are doing, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we want to position ourselves uh, in certain industries here. Uh, we have, at the same time, units who take care about uh, the programming or, let's say, the application side of Soaring Cloud. And I, I see a great chance to have uh, interconnected play. Uh, in that context, I'm, I'm pretty much interested, of course, uh, about the next step. And the next step is for me the, the so-called industry clouds, right? And uh, uh, personally, I know I'm very much into automotive, not only because I like to drive cars and in the future electric cars, but also uh, it's hard to be not in automotive when you are in Slovakia, right? In terms of car manufacturers, OEM suppliers we have here. Uh, but also into healthcare, you know, that these are uh, strategic areas we want to explore, we want to position ourselves. Now, connecting that back to sewer and cloud and what we are doing. So how do you see that becoming uh, an industry cloud? And we can also talk this in a broader context. Uh, I would also consider industry now government, which is, of course, not accurate, but as an example. So how do you see these specific applications or usage of sewer and cloud then in so-called industries? So from my past experience within, I uh, was also running a big data team for several years within within Deutsche Telekom, and we saw that uh, opportunities were coming from the automotive sector, especially in terms of the use cases like uh, uh, endurance testing, yeah, so testing new products and ensure they are built in certain quality, and also with uh, autonomous driving. So this is the evolution of the cars, yeah, which which is uh, is, is long runner, but. We saw these uh, opportunities and, and these use cases which are in common yeah, for all over the brands which are investing money and each and every producer and, and automotive producer has, I would say, pretty much the, the similar calls and their, this is the most sensitive part of their code and their personal development. So this is where the sovereign cloud can step into the game, right? Because obviously... Uh, for example, Daimler is one of our uh, largest clients. I'm sure their personal development and their best, uh, let's say, codes for the endurance testing or autonomous driving, they don't want to share that pretty much on the on the U.S. government or, or U.S. US offering. So this is where potentially I see a sovereign cloud. Uh, just I mean, for the records, and Volkswagen and, and BMW and others. Okay, no, <laughs> please continue yeah. that we are not offending any of our exactly, customers. Right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Big part of it is... And this is this is um, like one one play into the industry clouds is that we need to start understanding much better what is the need of that industry. We need to be more industry specific. A lot of a lot of our products are across the industries, right? They cater just as well to healthcare sector uh, and to automotive and to manufacturing, right? So um, this is where, where where I think we also and it it can go very nicely hand in hand with the with the sovereignty play that we are right now doing uh, but this is this is the, the the aspect that we shouldn't forget about like for example you know the connected car end to end connected car setup this is this is something where you really need to understand what is the need why do you need that kind of capacity or or you know uh, uh, iops or whatever right no you need more here etc cetera, etc cetera. that's why how a lot of the edge uh, computing uh, stuff was developed right because they needed to understand why does it make sense to not do it centrally in a cloud but you have to do it on the edge right um, so yeah, I think that this is also what we should, shouldn't forget about. Uh, it is said that government might have the highest need of such kind of services. Could be. We also know that government is not the most easiest customers, yeah, right. but that's for another discussion. So how do you see that? They probably won't, won't be one of our pilots. <laughs> They'll <laughs> wait how the situation will evolve, but definitely want to go into that area, especially start with cities or region. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's kind of a logical next step after after really doing some proof of concepts with um, some smaller amounts, less impact kind of situation. Um, maybe really local uh, local government entities like uh, cities, etc. I think it makes sense. Uh, to pick up on that, also what we currently certainly have is, uh, is requirements for digitization, which we right. try to drive with uh, low-code application developments because that makes it a bit faster and easier. Uh, but we are not discussing actually how to host it and mm. the sovereignty of this data. But that's a discussion for sure mm. that's going to happen in the future as well. Which actually brings me already to a sort of, of wrap-up. Yeah? And I would like uh, uh, to summarize it in a way that uh, I, I really like the pattern. Yeah? So if, if I look at what we have been doing with a very, very strong infrastructure focus, now moving into 
discussions like uh, data sovereignty, sovereign cloud. Yeah? At the same time, also thinking about uh, having the application development part of the sovereign cloud yeah? with the objective to be an integrator and having all these uh, application development skills. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's a fantastic pattern and I hope we're going to succeed on that uh, and accelerate in these areas. And in the terms of industry clouds, yes, you, you know that we are also focusing a lot on uh, full uh, vertical service provider, right? right? And if we have now this infrastructure and then we talk about automotive and we may be talking about health and we bring this all together, then I think uh, that's, that's, that's the right way for success and I hope we, we're going to go there we fast. Have to, we have to move up the yeah. stack, not only from a technology and product portfolio, but definitely in terms of the skilling of our employees, yeah, so we'll be able to face challenges like this one. And it's, it's, it's a logical evolution again, right? Because as things are moving more and more to code, uh, be becoming less and less hardware dependent. We just simply need to go in that direction. Otherwise, the, the skill set of the people will be obsolete. Um, and, and, you know, the, the Gartner theory is that uh, in, in IT, four years is the max that you can utilize your, your, uh, your <laughs> yes, skill set. Yes. In, in four years, it becomes obsolete, right? Um, and everything is really on, on that level. Everything is moving into, intru in, into code, into software. Uh, and we simply have to keep up. So that's it's very logical evolution also for, I think, for us as a company. I'm very happy to, to hear and to see that you are considered as that's the logical thing. Yeah, we <laughs> still, I <laughs> guess we still one. need to have a, a lot of activities around this change here, but that's then rather for another session, another discussion when we uh, perhaps talk about uh, uh, everything software defined, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, for, day, uh, for today, I would like to thank you for the discussion. I found it uh, very good, um, very educational for me. And uh, thank you for giving all this insight in Soaring Cloud and Data Sovereignty plus Industry Clouds and also Team Setup. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity and stay tuned. Thank you for having us here.